morning. Welcome to the Boardwalk Talk series brought to you by the Alabama Aquarium at the Dolphin Island Sea Lab. My name is Mendel Graber. I am one of the educators here at the lab. And this morning we're going to chat with Kara Gadigan about seafloor sediments and the organisms that live within those sediments. And I'll let Kara tell you a little bit about it. Yeah. Um, so one of my favorite analogies to make of the seafloor is that it's basically a giant compost pile on the bottom of the ocean. So things when they die in the water column will sink down, settle on the, the surface of the sediment um, and be broken down into their component parts, into nutrients, um, the building blocks of life to be returned back into the ecosystem. So they're doing a really important job um, in the ocean. And one of the things that's most important about sediments to understand is that oxygen is a really important factor um, in determining how sediments work and do their breakdown, organic matter breakdown function. So a lot of the times in sediments, you'll have at the surface an oxic layer right here. That's this rusty brown color. And then underneath that, you'll have anoxic sediments, meaning there's no oxygen there. So there's a lot of oxygen in the water, relatively speaking, um, and then that oxygen will diffuse into the surface layer of the sediments, but microbes um, and animals, when they're breaking down um, the dead stuff that's arriving on the seafloor, uh, will use up that oxygen in respiration. So there's this kind of structure to sediments where there's oxygen in this top layer, but there isn't any oxygen in the bottom layer. And you can even see that um, within the coloration of the sediments. So sediments everywhere are, are doing this function. Um, but for example, in a place like a marsh, this is happening over time. So in marshes, you'll have a very thin oxic layer at the top, but these uh, the animals and the microbes are using the oxygen really quickly. Um, and there is a layer of, a really deep layer of anoxic mud. So what happens in this anoxic layer is that the microbes that are breaking down that organic matter um, are actually using different molecules than oxygen um, to perform respiration, to break those things down. So I like to think of this as like, they're kind of like breathing rocks. <laughs> they're, they're breathing um, other molecules like iron or manganese, or in some cases even sulfur. So if you're ever driving by a marsh and you smell something that smells like, kind of like rotten eggs, that's what that smell is. That's sulfur. That's those microbes working over time to break down that organic matter. So there's a lot more than just the mud in the sediment. There's also a lot of animals that are doing really important things. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about the animals because it's one of my favorite things to talk about, give you kind of a, a tour of some of the kinds of things that we find. So these are a bunch of things that we find pretty commonly in this area. We have over here, this is my favorite worm right here uh, on, the, on your left. Um, this is the ice cream cone worm, otherwise known as the pectinarid. Uh, so these worms will live with their heads actually down in the sediment and their um, tail end sticking up. They construct these tubes out of little bits of sand um, and they have this golden mustache that they'll use to scrape at the mud um, their, and eat it. On their tail end? On their head end. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So is the, so you said the tail, the head end was down. So this, like just flip it, so. Oh, okay. This is how they normally are. Kind of like that, actually. You can find them at an angle. So they'll have their head end down. Um, this up here would be the surface of the sediment. And then they use this little mustache. It's not actually a mustache, but it looks a lot like a mustache, which is why they're one of my favorites. Um, and they'll scrape at the mud um, deep in the sediment um, and uh, eat it and extract nutrients from that. Um, what's, and the, what's the tube made of? It's made of sand. So this is actually, this is one of my favorite things about these worms is a lot of worms will construct these elaborate tube structures to hide in and protect themselves from predators. This worm in particular does a really interesting thing with sand grains where it, when it's building its tube, it builds it in kind of a, if you imagine an ice cream cone shape, very small at the tip and then it gets wider. As they're growing, as the worm is growing, they're also building that tube. So the way that they build the tube is by selecting individual grains of sand and then sort of orientating them so that the flattest side is on the inside. And then they spit on it and stick it to their tube so that the inside of their tube is a nearly perfectly flat surface, um, which is very cool. And can you give us an idea of the size of that worm? Yeah, so they come in all different sizes. I've seen uh, pectinarids that we get in this area that can be maybe this long, uh, which is pretty beefy for a worm. 
Um, but we also know that in, in different areas, they can be all different sizes. So worms in this area tend to be a little bit on the smaller side, but on the other hand, we find a huge diversity of worms here, which is really cool. Um, like for example, here we have an awenid worm, um, which is a kind of worm that builds this tube out of bits of rock and shell. It does a, a very similar thing where it um, adheres it to the shell or to the, to the tube um, with uh, bits of mucus. And it'll use this frilly crown structure to feed. Um, it can feed both by sticking its head up and, and waving these, this tentacle crown around to collect, to collect bits of things that are floating through the water. But then it'll also sort of bend its head down and feed around its tube, depending on where it can find more food. Um, you also have things like this, the ornate tube worm, also known as diopatra. It has this really brilliant iridescence to it. Um, so these worms also build tubes, um, but you can see here that it has these kind of frilly Christmas tree-like structures, and these are actually its gills. So access to oxygen to be able to breathe is really important, clearly, because um, it has these external gills that it'll sort of splay out in order to be able to breathe better. Um, and you can even, in sediments, very often find predatory worms. So this is a worm, it's a burrowing predator. It preys on other worms, smaller things that it finds in the sediment. And these worms, like a lot of worms, have an aversible pharynx, which basically that means that they can turn their throat inside out, shoot it out of their mouth, um, and catch prey. Um, this is a nephtid worm, but there's another type of worm called a blood worm, um, that sometimes you can find in this area that's a, a, a voracious predator. And it will avert its pharynx, um, and it has venomous fangs on the end of the pharynx that it uses to nab and, and basically sedate prey and pull it into its mouth, which is both terrifying and awesome. <laughs> so what kinds of things do they eat? Um, other smaller worms, um, usually uh, smaller deposit feeding worms, which would be worms that are just burrowing free in the in the sediment and eating whatever mud and extracting nutrients from that. Basically whatever they can get their hands on. <laughs> so you're telling us some fun things about the, the way these worms eat. Yeah. So, and you mentioned the gills on this one and the importance of um, being able to, you know, breathe mm -hmm. and have that, those structures that can kind of move outside of the tube. Yeah. Um, some animals use their gills to filter food. Yeah. So do these guys use this as a filtering structure for food as well as oxygen, or do they use some other uh, yeah, feeding not, structure? It's not really filtering so much as it is selecting. So these worms are so small that when things are floating by, they're, they're usually of a size where it will they will be able to nab it from, from the water. So it's, it's not so much like a, a net structure because they're small enough that a net structure doesn't really work um, for the way that these worms live. So that's why, you know, in science we call it suspension feeding, because they're not filter feeding per se, um, but they are selecting things out of the, the water that's going by. Do, the, do yeah. they use, do the uh, diapetra use their um, gills for I don't that? believe so. No, they, though, actually, diapetra have um, jaws that they use to nab things out of the water column. Um, which is really cool. They have several sets of jaws that kind of work like scissors to, they can reach up and sort of nab things out of the water, which is really awesome. Yeah, worm, worms have teeth, <laughs> which is cool. Um, and it's not just worms that live in sediments. There are a bunch of other things um, doing all sorts of stuff, um, doing very similar things in, in, the, um, in the mud. So we have here a picture of a brittle star um, which is one of my favorite non-worm <laughs> um, sediment organisms. Um, so these are kind of a sister taxa to starfish, um, but they're more brittle, <laughs> basically. So they have this central disc and these long sort of thin stringy legs. Um, so what these animals do is they bury their central disc a few centimeters down in the sediment, and then they stick their arms up and they'll catch things in the overlying water or they'll feed around on the surface of the sediment. Um, they're really cool animals, actually. Um, so that's what a lot of these worms are doing when they're burrowing through um, the sediment is they're, they're feeding on the sediments Egret. themselves, but they're also kind of mixing them up. Um, so one of the poster children of this process is the lugworm, which maybe looks the wormiest of all the worms <laughs> that I've showed you. So this is a lugworm, it's a big fat worm. Um, and what they do is they construct a burrow, a J-shaped burrow, where they'll feed 
um, down here at depth and they'll create kind of a funnel where sediments from the surface are falling down as they're eating it and then they'll back up and they'll poop at the surface. Um, so the effect that this has when lugworms are in very high density in a place like a mudflat is to be churning up the sediment. You can see all of these individual little piles of, of sediment are where the lugworms are churning up the sediment. So it can have some pretty huge drastic effects on, on the way that the sediment is structured um, and the, particularly the oxygenation of the sediment. So that's, that's a lot of what these worms are doing is they're mixing up the sediment, um, allowing surface sediments where all the good, fresh, tasty stuff has just fallen to get further down where microbes can access it um, and break it down further. Um, and also in the process of building burrows, they are um, very often flushing water into the burrow. Um, so they're making oxygenating it. more um, of the the depth of the mud, they're, they're making more of that habitable for other organisms. Yep, absolutely. And also making it more efficient at doing that organic matter recycling, composting, breakdown function, um, which is really, really important. So you can see, you can even see this actually in the coloration of the sediments when you look at them. So here's an example of, this is like a, a side view um, of a, call them worm farms or ant farms where you can see all of this area here, this darker color, that's that anoxic mud, but you can see the burrow structure that a nereid worm had, has made. And you can see that it's this lighter rusty color, which is you know normally associated with the very surface layer. So what they're doing when they're making these burrows is they're providing oxygen to deeper in the sediments where it wouldn't normally be. And you can see this very clearly in the burrows that all sorts of animals make. Here we have a burrowing shrimp, um, where you can see this oxygenated layer around the, the burrow. And they can make actually really elaborate chambered burrow structures sometimes, where you see this is a, um, a cast that's been made of a, a burrow structure where you have, you know, the surface would be up here, goes down, and then branches off into a bunch of networks because these worms are kind of roving around in the sediment, making burrows, exploring, eating what they find. Um, so even though you can't see it from the surface, there's a lot going on underneath. Um, yeah, so what I do is I study um, this oxygen thing in, in sediments. I'm really interested in how um, oxygen and the availability of oxygen affects how the sediments work. So oxygen in sediments, when it's gone, when there's an environmental stressor, um, can be really uh, harmful to seafloor ecosystems and affect how they do that organic matter breakdown thing. Um, so this, a, a trademark example of this is the dead zone off of the Louisiana shelf. So every summer for a few months, um, the entire seafloor becomes basically hypoxic, which is low oxygen or anoxic, which is no oxygen. Um, so you can imagine these animals that live in the sediments are really stressed out by that. Um, and you can see it very clearly um, if you look from the side, that's where I had it. Oh, maybe I didn't. Well, <laughs> so you can see this very clearly when you look from a side view of like a core, uh, a sediment core, where you can see the very, very, th a very thin layer of oxygenated, or sometimes the entire sediment column is just black. It's all anoxic. Um, and likewise, when oxygen goes away, um, these animals that rely on oxygen to breathe, you know, the, the worms and the clams and the, the shrimps um, are really stressed out by that and sometimes can even die from it. So that sediment mixing function that they're doing um, goes away when, when they do. So the dead zone off of the Louisiana shelf is, is one thing. That's a very dramatic example. But what my research focused on uh, was looking at a shorter term low oxygen. So um, in a lot of coastal areas, you'll get this thing called the diel cycle, or it's a, a daily cycle of oxygen, where during the day, oxygen levels in the water will go up because you know plants are photosynthesizing, the sun is out, they're producing oxygen. But then at night, sun goes away, everything is still respiring, so they're using up that oxygen. And what that results in is this kind of wave pattern through time on a daily scale um, of oxygen conditions. And we don't really know how that kind of low oxygen, um, where it's pretty short, but it's happening you know, consistently through time, 
Um, we don't really know how that affects these uh, sediment ecosystems or the way that these animals are functioning. We know that it probably isn't lethal to them because we still find animals alive and kicking where there's this very kind of variability. Um, but as far as how it's affecting the, the sediments breakdown of organic matter, that we don't really know so much about. So that was what my research focused on. So how do you, uh, how do you sample something like that? All sorts of ways. <laughs> um, so the ways that we use most often are a are grabs basically where you have on a boat basically a clampy gizmo that you'll hook to a, a rope throw it over the side it drops down to the bottom and then a mechanism is triggered where it clamps up a bunch of mud bring it up and you can see what's in there um, but that kind of gives you a random sample like you know if someone just went like that <laughs> to the mud so if you want to get something that's more sort of carefully collected um, then we'll do a lot of diving. Um, diving down to the, the bottom of the ocean, sticking basically a tube into the sediment, pulling it up with an intact, you know, section of the mud and bring it back to the lab to do experiments on it. So with the tube, you would preserve some of that layering of the oxic and yeah. anoxic. Uh, Hopefully, yeah. Mud, where with the grab, it all gets mixed It up. all gets, yeah. So the grabs we usually use if we're co interested in collecting animals to bring back to the lab um, and to study. But the cores are if we want to, to study the, the structure of the sediment um, more so than the animals. Or sometimes what we'll do is we'll bring back cores and then take some grabs and get animals and then put the animals in the cores to see what they do. Mm -hmm. So that they have, you know, a nice pristine sediment. Um, habitat to burrow in and do things so we can observe them. What kind of variability have you seen in that? Can we pull your picture of the oxic and anoxic? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Um, layering sure. out. So, um, just to remind everyone, the oxic is that layer that is um, it's oxygenated, and the yeah. anoxic is mm -hmm. not. And the the um, coloration i mean that this is kind of neat that you can see that distinct coloration would be reflective yeah. of the uh, bacteria that's working in there so that's reflective of um, the molecule iron so iron exists in a bunch of different states um, so here in this top layer that's where iron is um, oxygenated essentially so this basically what you're seeing here is is rust um, but then as it goes deeper, iron is not oxygenated, so that rust color goes away and you just get the black. Um, so what kind of variability have you seen in the, like the depth of the oxid layer? You can see a lot of variability. So in places um, like marshes, places that are getting a lot of um, dead stuff, basically, delivered to the sediment surface, that oxid layer is very thin. Um, very, very thin, like, you know, a couple of millimeters thin. Um, and that's, that's pretty common along the coast because there's a lot of outflow of organic matter, things coming from land being washed out to the ocean, dead stuff that needs to be broken down. Um, so that oxygen layer, the, the oxygen in the sediment is going away at a shallower depth um, than it would otherwise. As you get more offshore... Because animals are not burrowing as far looking for the... Um, um, nutrients? It's more because there's just the there's the no sheer problem. amount of the, the organic matter means that the, there's very high rates of organic matter breakdown and when you're breaking organic matter down you're using oxygen. So, so the you can see some of the mud there in the, mm -hmm. the marsh mud behind yeah. there. So you can see actually there's that it, it's kind of the brown color so that's the very very top surface. Um, of the sediment, but if you were to dig even just a little bit down, you would see um, basically black, <laughs> black sediments. Um, and actually in marshes, you can get really interesting um, effects of animals too, particularly like bur things like burrowing crabs that will create, you know, chambered burrows um, that are oxygenated and help to kind of flush the sediment out so that it's not so anoxic. Okay, so you were talking about some of the uh, variability. So um, ar around these coastal areas, is that kind of consistently a small oxic layer in the sediment? Um, in mud, yes, it is. Pretty, um, pretty, sh pretty shallow uh, oxic layer. Um, that can change if you're in something that's a little more sandy. 
um, because it's easier for oxygen to diffuse into sandy sediments. Um, but there, and you also in sandy sediments have less organic matter. Mm -hmm. So these things are all kind of tied together with the, the, the type of sediment it is, where it is, how much organic matter is reaching the seafloor there, um, all kind of work together to determine how good those sediments are at breaking the dead stuff down. So you pulled out the, um, the, um, yeah, the brittle star. Mm -hmm. So where do you find those around here? So we find them um, kind of all over the place. Uh, our favorite spot to get them is actually on the other side of Dauphin Island. There's a great little inlet there um, where you can get brittle stars. But we find them pretty commonly in the bay. We find them offshore. We find them all over the place. They are pretty ubiquitous, honestly. You can find them in a lot of places. Um, and it's, it can actually be really difficult to tell where you need to go to get certain kinds of organisms um, because this area is so dynamic. Um, the types of sediments and the patches where you find things can shift and change. Like, one year we'll go out to um, Petty Boy Pass, which is, you know, just on the other side of Dauphin Island, and we'll find loads of one thing, and then we come back a month later and there's none of it there. Or we come back the next year at the exact same time expecting to find it, and it's not there. And it's, it's really difficult to tell where you need to go because you don't know until you go out there and take a grab and look and say, oh, <laughs> where is it? it was, you know, it's supposed to be here. Um, so the, the ranges of these things in, in these area can move and shift around, and it also depends considerably on the time of year, too, um, which we have been figuring out for many years. <laughs> it's like sometimes you're going to go somewhere and it's just, you know, the thing you're looking for is not going to be there. Um, that happens pretty often with the type of clam that we like to use in experiments. Sometimes it's just not there. Um, so then you figure something else out. <laughs> So let's go back to that diel cycle, um, yeah. and you kind of mentioned that that is still kind of a, a piece of the puzzle yet to be figured out. Yeah. Um, and it, and you mentioned that um, you know you kind of made uh, reference to the, the dead zone with the hypoxia or anoxia, mm -hmm. um, but this would be sort of part of a normal everyday cycle um, and the idea is that maybe understanding that will help us um, see if there are some um, some effects that, that might um, exacerbate a, you know. Hey guys, wait, hey guys. Have y'all done the aquarium in Chattanooga? Yes. The, um, you know, just might might contribute to the stresses that these organisms are experiencing and when they add up you know you might see some uh, lethal effects yeah so the the dead zone off of the louisiana shelf has been linked through experimental studies and also modeling to the outflow of the mississippi river so the mississippi watershed collects a lot of nutrients a lot of organic matter that then shoots out of the mississippi into the mississippi delta um, and onto the, the shelf where the plankton and the water love nutrients. They grow, they bloom, and then after they bloom, they die. And they sink to the bottom, overload of organic matter, dead stuff, fresh, yummy dead stuff. And that sends the, the sediments into high gear where they're using up all the oxygen, breaking down that fresh organic matter that's just been delivered. And that's where you see the, the oxygen levels tank. So as we have been putting more nutrients into the Mississippi, every year during that season, there's that sort of bloom season where you see lots of nutrients being delivered to the, the delta. That's where you get the development of the dead zone, where all that oxygen is being used up um, in the process of breaking that stuff down. So human activities have been linked to the dead zone off the Louisiana shelf um, getting worse, let's say. But the diel cycle, um, we can think of that as more of a natural phenomenon that happens in coastal areas um, because, you know, photosynthesis and respiration, that, you know, seesaw of that on a daily cycle um, is a, a natural common occurrence. Um, but the idea is that in order to understand how sediments are working on the whole, we have to understand how they're working um, on a shorter time scale. 
So most of the time when, when scientists previously have been thinking about these um, sediment ecosystems, they think on the long scale um, and not necessarily on the, the, the short scale and how the things that are happening on the short scale could scale up to affect things on the long scale. So if sediments are not doing as well at certain times of the day, um, at breaking that dead stuff down, at, at you know metabolizing it, recycling it, that's something that we need to know in order to project out to the future how they're going to act, you know, long term. Seems like a pretty fine. It seems like it would be a pretty fine scale resolution. The, the yeah. Differences in the <laughs> very fine temporal resolution. Yeah. Um, and in well, and and in the um, amount of oxygen too. With the yeah, or do you see pretty big shifts? You can see crazy shifts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, depending on the time of year. wind and weather have a lot to do with it um, but you can see a lot of variability especially in places like this is that typical or would those be um, you know fairly random or would it be unusual um, it's typical for shallow um, shallow sediment ecosystems yeah we, we see that a lot and there there's actually been uh, a couple studies looking at sediment ecosystems all over um, North America essentially or you know the, the US um, and that the daily scale of oxygen varying um, is a consistent pattern at sites, you know, all over the West Coast, Gulf Coast, East Coast, everywhere you look, this thing happens. And, and you see the dramatic difference in the levels, not just a, not a small difference, but a big difference is pretty typical? A big difference is typical, yeah. Um, it's more, it, you're, you're more likely to find it in places that are um, more tropical um, rather than, you know, way up um, in some place like Maine or, you know, something like that. But you, you see it, you see it everywhere, yeah. So these organisms that live in this kind of environment, they're adaptive for it, but mm -hmm. still it may be a kind of a, a pulse of stress? Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a, a consistent stress, um, but it is a stress. And one of the things that we, we actually don't know that much about, which was one of my, the experiments that I did, um, was looking at how organisms react on the short term to, to that low oxygen. Because there have been a lot of studies looking at how when you take all of the oxygen away, how do these animals react? We, we know how they react. They, they can't deal with it. They, they either dramatically change their behavior or they die. Um, but what do they do? How do they cope with oxygen where it's low for a little bit, but then it goes back up? And then it's low for a little bit, and then it goes back up. And doing that repeatedly, what is that? How does that affect their behavior and what they're doing in the sediments as far as mixing it and affecting? Mm -hmm. the, and the so, what did you find with the animal <laughs> behavior? Um, so, what I found in that experiment, it has yet to be published, but I'll give you a sneak peek, um, was that the animals did, on, on average, what the animals did was when the oxygen got low, they would decrease their amount of activity, but you over several daily cycles what you ended up seeing was on on the whole they decreased their activity so what happens in most studies of that sediment mixing things that, that animals do is they have they, they hold the animals in consistent high oxygenation basically optimal conditions for the entire duration of the experiment you know so they have plenty of access to oxygen they can do whatever they want for you know however long they want. Um, or sometimes when studies will look at how animals respond to low oxygen, they will have high oxygen for a while and see what they do. And then they'll decrease the oxygen, that you know, the scientists will de de decrease the, the oxygen in the water and then see what they do, you know, holding them at low oxygen levels for, you know, a period of hours or days, what have you. Um, but that variability is what the animals are actually experiencing, you know, in their natural environment. And when you expose them to that, what they end up doing is decreasing their activity overall, even when the oxygen is very high. So when you expose them to a diol cycle, what they end up doing is decreasing their activity on average. And you wouldn't be able to see that if you just expose them to optimal oxygen conditions or even terrible oxygen conditions for a long time. Which is possibly important if you're trying to understand what they're actually doing and scale that up over, you know, 
years or even decades. So when you say they decrease their um, activity, so yeah. this is decreasing like burrowing activity, feeding activity, mm -hmm. Bur uh, moving. Yeah. Primarily what I saw was burrowing activity. They decreased. they decreased how much they were mixing that sediment up. And that's important because the mixing the sediment is related to the amount of dead stuff that the microbes in the sediment can break down. Because that's what the animals are helping with. So much of what we understand about how these organisms um, oxygenate the sediment comes from lab experiments. Yeah. And so you were trying to refine, um, you know, that understanding by, you know, mimicking the natural um, conditions that they yeah. are working with, mm -hmm. you know, at a, at a smaller time scale. Yeah, yeah um, definitely. Which is all credit due to previous you know, scientists who try, it's, it, it's very difficult <laughs> to set up a lab, an experiment in the lab that accurately represents what's going on. Um, in well, so, you know, for example, if you give them optimal conditions, then, you know, your animals are more likely to survive. Yeah. And so maybe there's, there's, I mean, science is building, you know, it's a yeah. building process. So, you know, some of that would be kind of refining the, um, the lab techniques, you know, for Absolutely. keeping animals, you know, alive and, and being able to observe them. Yeah. And, and actually what I ended up having to do was build my own system to, to manipulate the oxygen conditions in the lab. Mm -hmm. Because all of the ways to do that that have been used before were either very complicated or very expensive um, or both. <laughs> so uh, I was not willing to pay a lot of money to do this. And I also wanted it to be simple enough that anyone could do this. Because part of what I'm interested in is getting other people to, you know, to acknowledge this as being an open area for investigation and be able to do it practically in the lab. Yeah. Um, so I, I built a system out of um, my own sort of electronics and, and uh, Arduino, which is a, a microcontroller, basically a mini computer. Um, I built a system to manipulate oxygen in the lab that theoretically anyone could build and use. Hopefully people do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and that'll be part of your published paper? Yeah, it's already published. Oh, yeah. okay. And it will be in my dissertation. Yeah. Yep. So people have access to that. Design. Absolutely, yeah. And it's it's open access and it's in an open access journal. So if you're interested in doing that, definitely do it. Nice. And so going back a little bit to the like the lab techniques that you were mentioning, so yep. dropping the oxygen to a stress stress level, you know, might give us some information about what they're experiencing and how they're behaving mm -hmm. like in a like in a dead zone yeah so that that would there would be a rationale for doing that too mm -hmm. um so is there going back to what you were doing with the dial cycle that you were um simulating was there is there a and we mentioned the reduced activity so um just the 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 reason that they might react that way is because they're not using as much uh, oxygen when they are less active so yeah. that's a response to that yeah burrowing is work um it's it's quite a bit of work actually for for worms to do so or you know any burrowing organism to do so by decreasing their the amount of burrowing that they're doing they're decreasing the amount of um, oxygen that they're using up when mm -hmm. oxygen is very low which you know makes sense did you see uh, differences in different in the way different animals behave, or were they kind of consistently? Um, yeah, one of the animals did kind of bounce back after a, a daily cycle, um, but then as more, you know, as another daily cycle of varying oxygen happened, it it ended up decreasing the activity. Well, so I should um, specify I meant different species. So different are you species. talking about different individuals within the same species? No, 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 different. Yeah, different species. Okay, so one of the aspect. species that you were looking at had a different kind of reaction. Mm -hmm. Actually, it was the brittle star. Yeah. Too. It was the the oxygen went down. It was like, <gasps> and then oxygen went back up. It was like, oh, okay, good. But then after another, it was like, I'm, <laughs> I'm out. It's you know, decreased its activity. So. Was that had they been kept in a lab at like a high oxygen level for a period of time before yeah, they had. your experiment started? Yeah. So they'd been kind of acclimated to that high, yeah. optimal. Uh, or that higher oxygen yeah. condition where they might have changed their behavior from what they were doing out mm -hmm. in, in their natural environment. Yeah, and, you... and the interesting thing about that is there was only so long that I could run the experiment because it was, it was a very time and energy intensive experiment to run. Um, but part of me does wonder if I had run it for a few more 
diurnal cycles, would I have seen them kind of bounce back? Would I have seen them just, you know, less and less and less, and so they're basically doing nothing? Um, that's an open question. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's, and it's interesting because you only really see the effect after you've been exposing them to multiple daily cycles. So even just doing it once might not be enough to see what might theoretically be happening on the longer term, mm -hmm. which is cool. So uh, can you give us some sort of idea of the abundance of these organisms in the, in the oh. sediment? <laughs> <laughs> That's a tricky question. Um, there are, well, if you're looking at like large organisms, lar large worms, burrowing worms, um, you can get, you know, dozens of them in a square meter, depending on where you are. Um, but worms of all sizes or critters of all sizes, it's hundreds of thousands usually mm -hmm. in, in a square meter. And you're talking about animals? Animals, yeah. yeah. Um, is there something that you kind of feel like is a big, broad pi picture message that you want folks to, to leave with? Oh. <laughs> yeah, I should probably have one of those. Um, basically, the sediments are important. You might not see them every day, but they're playing a really important role in the marine ecosystem. So don't forget about the seafloor when you see the pretty pictures of the coral reefs or, you know, the swimming tuna or the dolphins. There's something under there. There's something underneath all of that, and that's the sediments. Um, well, and it's part of the nutrient cycle. So it's an incredibly uh, important part of the nutrient cycle. As you cycle. mentioned, you know, they're kind of... Um, you know, returning nutrients to yeah. you, like like a, a life, uh, something's life cycle, the life cycle in general. Yeah, absolutely. Very important. And very cool. Also. So, I mean, for sometimes we call, you know, if it's kind of like locked into the sediment, you know, it's like sequestered in the sediment in some way. Yeah. And this wouldn't be like for all of time. It, you know, we might be looking at a geologic time scale where it eventually gets cycled back. But, mm -hmm. um, but you know, if, if it's locked in for a for a period of time, yeah, you know, then then it's mm -hmm. it's not cycling through. Yeah, um, but S sediments are very important for locking away, particularly carbon, um, which is of importance because of you know the the climate crisis that we're in right now. Um, if you think about just the sheer area of sediments where there is to for for the you know dead stuff to settle. And then eventually be buried and you know quote unquote locked away that is substantial so they're doing an important job definitely and you know and that would eventually you know if it's there long enough you know that um locking away of carbon ends up turning into fossil fuels potentially yeah uh, mm -hmm. long time long time yeah but then, Ge but then geologic you, time definitely. yeah right but then you've got this um important role that they play also returning nutrients to things that you know yeah can, can use them for yep. their life Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an important sort of balancing act that, that sediments are doing, um, where some of it's being locked away, um, but some of it's being sort of broken down and recycled and reused by you know, plants and animals and microbes and fungi and, you know, all sorts of stuff. So it might be kind of, these nutrients might be kind of in the water column where the plants could use them, or they might also be returned, you know, by things eating the worms. You know, Absolutely. Fish coming along and yeah. eating a worm and moving on. Mm -hmm. and that's, that's a really important point. <laughs> Thank you for making that. Uh, where worms, when they're, they're, they're consuming the sediments uh, kind of in bulk, they're, they're consuming sediment along with the, the organic goop that's attached to the sediment. Um, and in doing so, they're extracting the nutrients and turning it into worm, you know, in, into more, more biomass, more animal um, that a fish or a crab or whatever can come along and eat. So it's a very in, uh, effective way of transforming things that are not normally accessible to those the you know the crabs and the fish and whatever um into something that they can actually eat and, and pass on a tricky mm -hmm. well thanks for chatting with us this morning sure no problem happy to do it and thanks for joining us